Welcome. Welcome to worship service at East Union this Sunday morning. I can't say how much I love hearing the sound of all of you enjoying each other this morning. I um, also want to welcome those who are worshiping with us virtually and give a special welcome to our guests who are with us today. We're so pleased to have you here. I invite you into this time of shared experience. We are sharing as community and as a body of shared worshiping together of our Lord. So as a community, we start our service by looking at what we have going on together. We have some announcements that will be coming up on the screen for you, some reminders. These are things that are also in your bulletin, so you can check that out. But I'd like to invite Marv to come forward if anyone has any additional announcements today in the sanctuary. You'll notice the first one is tomorrow night. So you want to pay attention if you're interested in that. That's coming up quickly. It's just raise your hand if you have an announcement to add. Yeah, this is Doyle guy here. I have a couple announcements. Uh, one uh, with a couple different hats on. Uh, first is the adult Sunday school superintendent. Um, if you'll notice in the bulletin, there's going to be an ongoing bulletin that will note about where where classes sorry where classes meet and uh, what they're discussing. If you have any changes in those, or if I've gotten them wrong, but, uh, talk to me about that. Um, also, if somebody in your Sunday school class from now on can just text me your uh, uh, attendance, okay? So appoint somebody as the official texter and probably somebody in your class as my cell phone number. And a second announcement is about my role as a church historian. Uh, in my first year, I was just pretty much uh, on cruise control, but now I'm really <laughs> gaining momentum. Uh, we we ordered a uh, a photo frame uh, that's going to go in the uh, east uh, excuse me on the west side of the historical cabinet. I'm kind of trying to um, update the, the west side, and so on the for, for the first round of this photo frame, at least what I'm going to try to do right away is to uh, get, uh, cruise some pictures uh, that I'll call uh, church uh, church life. Okay. So if anybody has any photos of things that have happened at East Union, especially, uh, you know, we have access to uh, some, but uh, if you have any that are uh, farther back in church history, if you could uh, maybe even take, just take a picture on your camera, or if you have a scanner, that would even be better. But uh, take a good picture on your camera, or if you have a digital picture, just email me those. Um, and then with this photo frame, for right now I'll be the curator of that. So you can send me photos, and then uh, it's a deal where I just put the pictures on a up to load them up to the cloud, and then uh, it, it'll play through those uh, photos. So um, it all this one that we bought also has a, a on-off feature where if you just walk by, the photos will start uh, cycling through. So. That's uh, another project uh, we're working on for the Church History uh, Museum downstairs. Thank you, Doyle. Other announcements? This is Greg Yoder, like Doyle, I have a couple different hats to put on today. Um, the first one, just a reminder, there was a, as part of the weekly email that was sent out, there was a link to a survey. We, I would love your feedback. Um, if you take, literally take about two minutes to complete it, uh, if you don't have a smartphone or a computer that you regularly access your email, I also did print out a few copies of the survey. and so. Uh, they're below the mailboxes today in church, so <laughs> I would encourage you to just fill those out and put them back in my mailbox. We, will, we just want as much feedback as possible. 
Um, then the second announcement has to do with um, our, our Zoom services that we have on, on Sunday mornings. Um, moving forward, we're going to have a different Zoom link. So those of you who wish to join church, um, and maybe you have the, the, the link bookmarked and just click on the same thing every week, there will be um, a new link being put out this week. And so uh, we would encourage you to uh, make sure you take note of that, replace it if you happen to have it bookmarked on your computer. Um, it, it is especially for our Zoom participants. They're going to be using a different link starting next week. The Zoom login will use the same meeting ID, but it will also include a password. The instructions will be sent in the weekly email bulletin and updated on the East Union website. If you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to contact Emily Yoder, Janet Geyer, Greg Yoder, or Joel Beachy uh, with questions about that. Thank you. This is Marlon Logan. Uh, I have some real great news for you this morning, and I'm sure that many people are wanting to know. Uh, we have just received this from Grace, and I will read what it says. Very preliminary figures from the Pleasant View Benefit sale this past week show that the gross receipts are exceeding $82,480. There are some invoices outstanding, so this number will change, but we have to go back to 2015 to find gross income over $82,000. So this is great news. In behalf of the board, we want to thank you for all your help. And there was a lot of presence from East Union there. And please pass your thanks on to the community. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot to say one thing, uh, point out one thing on the adult Sunday school. Uh, after church this morning, in the basement, there's the kitchen class, uh, and that's especially, we want to especially welcome guests and uh, former students, I'm looking at you. All right, if there's no other announcements from the sanctuary, I want to check in with our friends on Zoom if anyone has an announcement there. Thank you so much, but Zoom, yes, I hope you did re um, recognize that announcement about the change of the login. So, point that out one more time. Since I have the mic, I'm also going to point out one more announcement. Tuesday night is the um, Crooked Creek annual meeting to do business we do need a quorum there so if you if you're an association member and you can be there please do uh, let the camp know and try to be there for that thank you so to move into more of a time of worship now would you join with me in the call to worship this can be found on the screen it's also in the purple voices together book number 976 this is a prayer for healing I'm going to read the light print. I'm also going to read the dark print with you. And you are welcome to join in the dark print for all of those lines or any lines that you choose to read from it. Great physician, you touched the lives of the sick and the troubled. Your hands rested on bodies in crisis. Your words soothed broken hearts. We call on you today, O oh God because we need your healing. Where we have pain, bring relief. When we are disoriented, bring clarity. 
when we confront disease or brokenness, bring healing. When we wait for tests or news, bring patience. When we live with barriers, bring courage. When we are bound by addiction, bring freedom. When illness separates us from others, bring friendship. When we cannot make ends meet, help us. You are with us in loneliness, bringing comfort. You are with us in despair, bringing hope. You are the God who cares and heals. Our scripture and sermon today will be focused on um, the story from Second Kings and to get you oriented towards that, we're using that setting as a prayer of reflection on Naaman's story. So you can just close your eyes and let this um, start to begin to get your mind thinking and preparing for this. Would you pray with me? A little girl, an army commander, a religious zealot for one brief moment. Difference suspended, doubt superseded of Elijah to love outside the lines. Ordinary water, simple ritual, extraordinary presence. May we have the courage of the child to reach out to even the powerful. May we have the wisdom of Naaman to ask for help when we are lost. May we have the faithfulness. Amen. I'm going to welcome W to come on up and lead us in some songs of worship. Let us stand, if able, for gathering songs this morning. We'll be singing out of the Voices Together hymnal. Our first song will be number 36. Let us build a house and sing out the hymnal or the song will be projected on the screen. Oh, 
song of gathering is number 453, number 453, as I went down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying abroad the good old way and who shall wear who told me crown good lord show me the way oh sisters let's go down let's go down come on down oh sisters let's go down down to the river to pray as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who should wear the story round, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down down to the river to pray as i went down to the river to pray studying about the good old way and who shall bear story from good lord show me the way oh children let's go down Let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way and who shall pray. song of welcome and gathering is number 544 softly and tenderly jesus is calling 544 Thank you. 
seated for our final song of prayer number 754 in my life be glorified
Thank you, Elise. It is our time of offering, and you'll notice something different happening than has recently, and that is that Marv has brought our offering basket halfway up the aisle. What I'd like to invite you to do right now is that if you have something in your pocket you'd like to place in the offering, if this is an opportunity for you to stand up and do that, but I also would like you to use this opportunity as you stand up to greet those around you, share the peace of God with each other. So we'll do that for just a few minutes. When you hear some music starting again, then that's your signal to please sit back down. Okay? So you're welcome to do so. As I suspected, I bet you talked about more than just sharing of peace, it sounded like. First of all, second of all, why is it the people in front always follow directions better than the people in the back? I'm looking at you, Paulette. All right, let's pray together. Dear Lord, we, we feel your presence here today. We feel it in your spirit here with us, and we feel it in the people that have joined together as community. We are community in so many different ways, and one of those is how we give our greetings and how we share our resources. I just thank you for the generosity and the giving of this church family. I pray a blessing on all that's been given, both time, money, gifts, this week and as we go forward. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, kids. You know what time it is. Lord of mine, I will shine. It's the light of mine. I will shine. It's the light of Good morning, everybody. Today's story, as I said, is about Naaman. Does anyone who know who Naaman is? Have you heard of him? You have? What can you tell me about Naaman? Anything? Okay. Um, so let's watch a video and we'll learn more about him. God's story, Naaman. So part of God's story is about a man called Naaman, and it goes like this. Naaman was a mighty warrior in a kingdom called Aram. Aram had conquered God's special family, the Israelites, and made a lot of them their slaves. One of those slaves was a little girl who lived in Naaman's house. Now, Naaman was an awesome warrior, and he was rich and famous, but he also had leprosy. Leprosy is a really serious skin disease that can make parts of a person's body fall off. 
like their fingers and toes. Back then, there were no hospitals or skin doctors or medicine that could help heal a person's leprosy. And because leprosy is contagious, people avoided lepers, and sometimes even made them leave their homes and cities and live out in the wilderness, away from everyone else. Anyway, the slave girl knew about Naaman's leprosy, but she also knew that God is more powerful than any disease. One day she said, I wish my master would go and see the prophet who is in Samaria. He would heal my master of his skin disease which is a pretty big deal. She might have had all kinds of reasons to want bad things to happen to Naaman, but instead, she wanted God to do good things for him. Naaman hurried to find the prophet the girl talked about, a man named Elisha. A prophet is someone who hears from God and shares God's messages with others. And with God's help, prophets like Elisha could do some pretty incredible things. When Elisha heard the powerful warrior Naaman was there to see him, Elisha sent his messenger to meet him. The messenger said, go, wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. Then your skin will be healed. You will be pure and clean again. Naaman said, I was sure Elisha would come out to me. I thought he would stand here and pray to the Lord his God. Then I would be healed. Naaman was kind of upset and offended. He had come all this way and Elisha wouldn't even see him. And then basically told him to take a bath in a river that probably had mud and bugs in it seven times. Kids, would you obey God even if it seems strange or kind of gross? Naaman started to leave, but his servants stopped him. They said, what if Elisha the prophet had told you to do some great thing? Wouldn't you have done it? But he only said, wash yourself, then you will be pure and clean. You should be even more willing to do that. Naaman thought about it and decided to follow Elisha's orders. He went down to the Jordan River and got himself in and out of the water seven times. And then a miracle happened. Naaman's skin became pure and clean again, like the skin of a much younger man. Naaman ran back to Elisha. Naaman said, now I know that there is no God anywhere in the whole world except in Israel. Then Naaman tried to pay Elisha for the miracle, but Elisha said, I serve the Lord. You can be sure that he lives and you can be just as sure that I won't accept a gift from you. Go in peace. So Naaman went home, but he promised he would never again worship anything except God. And that's the story of Naaman. Okay, so how was Naaman healed? You can tell me what healed him. What do you think, Simon? In the Jordan River, you're exactly right. So let's talk about water this morning. Who likes to drink water? Yeah? Do you like to drink it a little bit more if you put some lemonade or Kool-Aid in it? Does that help a little bit? Yeah. And who likes to play in the water? Okay, how do you play in the water? Charlie, how do you play in the water? You could swim like in a pool or a lake. What about you, Ethan? You like to dive? Who plays in the bathtub? Yeah, and what else can you do in a pool or a lake? You could play on a boat. Yeah, what do you like to do? What do you want to do? Flips off the diving board, you guys are adventurous. Yeah. And who uses water? You jump in it. How can you use water? Josie, do you use water? Do you take a bath? Do you use it to clean yourself? Do you use it, does your mom wash dishes with water? Or wash your clothes if they get all stained up with your adventures? Yeah. So water is critical for every living thing. Is that kind of crazy? So, hey, listen up, guys. There's so many stories about water in the Bible. Can you guess how many times the word water is used in the Bible? What's your guess? Two times? I think it's a little more than that. 100? Even more. One more guess? Josie, what's your guess? 1,000. Well, 722 times. So important. So here are some Bible stories that talk about water, and I want you to think about if you know these stories, okay? The woman at the well, when Jesus walked on water, do you know that one? And when Jesus turned water into wine, when Jesus was baptized, when a rock was struck and water came out, when God parted the Red Sea, Noah and the ark, is that a story up here? And Jonah and the whale, 
when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And now our story today about Naaman being healed by the water. That's a lot of stories, isn't it? There's probably more too. Yeah. Um, so water is a symbol of God's promise and power in the Bible. Through these stories, water is tied to miracles, cleansing, forgiveness, and redemption. In our story today, Naaman was healed through a miracle in the water, even in the yucky water, right? Does that look pretty gross? doesn't look like the picture over there. And that miracle helped him to turn to and follow God. So today, I'm going to give you each a rubber duck to remind you how we talked about water and how important it is. We need water to live, but it's important in the Bible and a symbol of baptism. Okay, hold on. The ducks do have squeakers, though. So when you go back to your parents, your parents have to hold them. Got that, parents? We don't want squeaking during church. So let's pray, and then we'll get the ducks out, okay? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for giving us these stories that we can learn more about you. Thank you especially for life-giving water. Help us to remember you every time we take a drink, wash our hands, or play with our rubber ducks. Help us to listen carefully to what Mara has to share with us this morning about the story of Naaman. Amen. Now the competition is on as to following directions, isn't it? <laughs> Parents, I encourage you to uh, place those aside, especially since we have a guest speaker this morning that's going to be sharing with us. Sorry, Mara. <laughs> Well, we've been introduced to the story of Naaman through our prayer. You've heard the story here. I have to tell you that in adult learning theory, this is an incredible way for you to really learn today to hear this multiple times in multiple ways. So I am going to read the scripture and then we, um, I'll introduce our, actually I'll just go ahead and introduce her right now. Mara will be speaking with us. Mara um, is married to Corbin. Do you go by Bushheart? I guess I didn't say your last. Weaver Bushheart? Awesome. The um, Bushhart side of their family, you may know, um, Dave and Jana, and then Mara's parents actually just happened to be in town this weekend, and so they are here from Illinois, central Illinois with us. Um, Mara and Carbon moved back to the Wellman area just this past summer. She's working with the Immigration Legal Services. She does that remotely from her home. She graduated from um, AMBS, in the same class as Joel. And she makes the mistake of playing pickup soccer with him on Sundays. And that's what placed her here today when um, we're very pleased of that, um, when Joel had needed to be gone. So all of you love the connection thing. So just two little connections. Well, three, now I can add on that, Corbin, I assume you were Doyle's student in school. Um, and also a cousin to Jerry, so y'all can figure that one out. And Mara's cousin is Janet's cousin, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so there's those connections that we all like to have. Mara will be coming up to share with us on 2 Kings 5, 1 through 19. I'm going to be sharing this with you from the New International Version. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served as Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl of Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. 
As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand above the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramonto, bow down, uh, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, May the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elijah said. Welcome, Mara. Let's pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Hello. It's good to be with you. So first things first, I have a very small confession I need to get off my chest. So Joel texted me earlier in the week, and I assume he was texting you with the logistics, what to expect for this morning. But all I could see of the message on my phone's lock screen when it came in was, we've been doing an old school flannel. And naturally, the first thing that came to mind was that you've been doing an old school flannel season, because that's normal for churches. So I thought you were all just wearing flannel to church these days. And I got really excited thinking I'd be able to don my favorite flannel to come to the pulpit with uh, not just permission, but encouragement. So to my disappointment, when I opened the message, he said, we've been doing an old school flannel board, uh, which I guess is fine too. But I didn't wear flannel this morning. This is definitely a good flannel board story, which is saying something for kings. There are plenty of not so fun stories in first and second kings, plenty of things going wrong and people falling short. But in this vignette, we get compassion for enemies, miraculous healing, conversion, faithfulness, you name it. And woven through all these positive things, we have this underlying constant thread that reminds us when it comes to God, expect the unexpected. As we get into Kings, we've already been through a lot of ups and downs in leadership among God's chosen people. As the curtains open on the beginning of this 
uh, stage in Israel's history, David has unified the tribes of Israel into one kingdom, and God has promised that a messianic king will come from David's line to fulfill all the covenant promises that David, that God made to Abraham, bringing God's kingdom on earth and blessing all the nations through it. David was not that king, and spoiler alert, the books of First and Second Kings spend a long time telling us that, among other things, none of these kings who succeeded David were that promised messianic king either. Kings covers the chunk of history from David's reign to the Babylonian exile, and in that time period, things go from disappointing to catastrophic. David's son Solomon ends up more like the rulers of the nations than like his father. He's not faithful to the God of the covenant and instead worships the gods of other nations. Under Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the kingdom of Israel splits in two. Also not great. You have Judah in the south with Jerusalem as its capital and David's line on the throne and Israel in the north under Jeroboam where Samaria will eventually be its capital. And we heard about Samaria in our story today. Not to be outdone by the southern kingdom and its temple in Jerusalem, Jeroboam builds two new temples to show just how present the God of Israel is with the northern kingdom. To top it off, he decides that a golden calf in each temple would be a great idea since golden calves have worked out so well for Israel in the past. It's always a good sign when one of those shows up. As the book continues, the author goes on to name a slew of kings from both kingdoms, always evaluating them on three criteria. First, did they worship the only God of Israel? Second, did they address idolatry among their people? And third, were they as faithful to the covenant with God as David was? None of the 20 kings named from the northern kingdom passed this litmus test, and only eight of the 20 from the southern kingdom pass it. Not a very good record. But God doesn't abandon the covenant project. Enter the prophets, those whom God provided to speak to the kingdoms on God's behalf, calling out idolatry and injustice, encouraging repentance, and reminding Israel that they were called to be such bright, blessed beacons of God's light that other nations would come to be blessed through them. Some of the prophets also perform miracles by the power of God, and the stories of Elijah and Elisha's miraculous works in particular provide the literary center of the Book of Kings, if we look at First and Second Kings as one continuous book. So that's the whirlwind big picture. And the little picture we're about to focus in on is one of those miraculous beats at the heart of this book. As we zoom in on the little picture, we find Naaman. Naaman is from the kingdom of Aram, or ancient Syria. Your Bibles might use either of those names. Ancient Syria had similar borders to present-day Syria. It was the kingdom to the northeast of Israel. So Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel were neighbors, and they were also frequent rivals. At the time of this story, they'd had military conflict off and on for about a century, but they were in a moment of peace. Given this context, Naaman, a successful Syrian military commander, was probably not someone your average Israelite was dying to pal around with. Naaman's story stands out in the biblical narrative because it's a story that recounts God at work in the life of someone outside of God's covenant people. And the narrative makes God's hand in Naaman's life very clear from the beginning. The text tells us that even the victories that Naaman had had as a military commander for Syria had been because Yahweh gave him that victory. To be fair, calling this Naaman's story is oversimplifying it a bit. He's not the only one with something to teach us here. The narrative can only begin to unfold because of the initiative of a young, captive Israelite girl who's assigned to the service of Naaman's wife. 
This girl learns that Naaman suffers from leprosy, and instead of saying good riddance to her captors, she puts herself in a place of vulnerability by suggesting to her mistress that Naaman go to Elisha in Israel. Naaman's keen enough on the idea that he asks his king if he can make the trip. The king agrees, and for good measure, he sends a letter with Naaman to give to the king of Israel so that he'll know why this foreign commander has come into his territory, trying to keep everything above board. Now, Naaman didn't necessarily have what we would call leprosy today. He may have, but the term leprosy is used throughout the biblical narrative to describe a whole slew of skin conditions. Whatever kind of skin disease Naaman had, it wasn't so serious that it kept him from being a successful commander in the army of Aram, but it did cause him enough pain or discomfort or inconvenience that he was willing to travel a good distance to the lands of his kingdom's on-again, off-again enemies and was prepared to pay a hefty sum to be rid of the condition. So Naaman and his party first go to the king of Israel, rather than going straight to Elisha, the prophet of whom the Israelite girl has spoken. King Jehoram apparently won for theatrics. Upon receiving Naaman and reading the note from the king of Syria, tears his clothes and he says, am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Jehoram thinks that the king of Aram is trying to pull a fast one on him, putting this impossible task before him just so that he will fail, giving the Arameans reason to dive into another military conflict with Israel. On the one hand, we can hardly blame him for reacting the way that he does. He has the safety of his kingdom in mind. But if we dig deeper, what his reaction reveals is just how far removed he is from a mindset that centers the God of Israel. It's almost as if we have this king thrown in to serve as a foil to highlight the faith of the other characters in the story. He seems to be completely on a different plane than the servant girl, as well as what we'll see of Elisha and eventually Naaman. For Jehoram, it's simply outside the realm of possibility that someone from another nation would actually come to Israel in search of healing. What's more, it suggests that he doesn't believe Naaman could actually be convinced of the power of God. And I suspect this is because Jehoram himself is not convinced of the power of God. A servant girl living in captivity, far from home, at the mercy of the household she served, had the faith, the courage, and the mercy to suggest that Naaman seek healing at the hands of her God. And yet the king of Israel, who claims to sit on the throne as the anointed leader of God's chosen people, can only imagine treachery and malice from this man who has come with a genuine request. His atrophied faith leads him to think that it is on him to heal Naaman, and that the God of Israel has nothing particularly special or unique to offer. This is Israel's representative. And unfortunately, Jehoram's lack of faith is indicative of the general lack of faith throughout Israel at the time. Luckily, Elisha gets wind of this kerfuffle with Jehoram and Naaman and the note from the Syrian king, and he intervenes. Elisha says, hey, remember me? I'm the prophet who's been performing miracles. Why not send this guy my way? But when Naaman arrives at Elisha's house, Elisha sends a messenger to meet Naaman at the entrance. And the messenger says, go wash seven times in the Jordan River. Well, that takes Naaman right off. He had assumed that for someone of his status, this prophet would surely come heal him personally. Instead, Naaman doesn't even get to meet the so-called man of God and has to settle for secondhand instructions to go take a dip in some river. 
Naaman did not come all this way just to get the cold shoulder from some foreign prophet and be fed some poppycock about washing away his leprosy. If it was that easy, he would have done it. If all it took was a splash about in the nearest river, he could have stayed home and done that in the superior rivers of Damascus. Now, had Naaman been an Israelite, he probably would have reacted differently when he heard Elisha's instructions. It might have been more of an, I see what you're doing there kind of thing. First of all, seven is the number of completeness. And more importantly, the Jordan is not just some random river. It has been and will continue to be the site of some really important moments in the lives of God's people. It was this river that Jacob crossed to be reunited with his estranged brother after wrestling with God and being renamed Israel. It was this river that the Israelites crossed when they finally entered into the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. It was this river that God reduced to a trickle while the tribes of Israel set up a memorial of 12 stones to remember who they were as God's people and what God had done for them. It was this river that was recently the site of Elisha's own transition from apprentice to master after Elijah was taken up and Elisha, grief-stricken, tore his robes in two, cried out to the Lord, and struck the Jordan with Elijah's cloak. The Jordan parted, and Elisha crossed through, entering into the waters of trial and coming out the other side, where the spirit of Elijah came to rest on him. Generations later, it will be this river that Jesus will enter for baptism. And when he emerges, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him as God claims him as his son. These waters are waters of deliverance, of new life, of transformation, and as Naaman will soon learn, healing. Once again, the servants intervene. They put themselves on the line, daring to suggest to their master, who's not in the most charitable of moods, that just because Elisha's prescribed method of healing is simple, doesn't necessarily mean it will fail. To his credit, Naaman actually listens. He goes and washes seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman isn't a believer when he enters the water. He hasn't been following Yahweh's law. Just a minute before, he was wholly unconvinced of Elisha's methods. But for some reason, he is compelled just enough to go and try it. Still, it's not like he's arriving at this river and throwing himself at the mercy of God or confessing that Yahweh is the one true God. He probably went into the Jordan reluctantly, maybe still annoyed, not expecting much to happen, only trying because he might as well after making this long journey. And God meets him there in this place of profound ambivalence. In God's grace, God chooses to heal this reluctant help seeker, enemy of Israel, who's by no means a worshiper of God or a participant in God's covenant. And Naaman, as so many others before him, emerges from those waters changed. His condition is healed, and that experience of God's love has permanently altered him. Naaman's response is to return with all those traveling with him to Elisha and to proclaim that the God of Israel is the one true God. That's a big deal. All aspects of Naaman's life in Syria would have been bound up with the gods of that nation. 
his identity as a Syrian, as a servant of the king, as a military commander, his culture, every facet of his life would have had other gods woven through it. And here he is, pulling on that thread and surrendering himself to the task of remaking his life, putting all that he has and all that he knows on the line around the conviction of and the gratitude for the knowledge that Yahweh is the one true God, his God. Naaman makes one more request before he heads home. He has to take as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. I can't say that dirt is the first thing that comes to mind when I think of a good souvenir to bring back from a trip abroad, but this dirt mattered to Naaman. Bringing a piece of earth back from that place where he had encountered God mattered. It was not just a memorial to this experience, but a testament to Naaman's desire for God to reign supreme in his life and the life of his household from that point on. In the ancient Near Eastern worldview, gods were territorial. They were tied to geopolitical boundaries of the nations that worshipped them. Yahweh was the God of Israel, not just in the spiritual sense, but the physical sense. From the perspective of the nations, Yahweh was sovereign over the geographical territories of Israel and Judah, but not necessarily anywhere else. Naaman couldn't remain in that territory, so he asked to take a piece of it with him. And with that small piece of Yahweh's territory, Naaman could establish an altar to the God of Israel whom he had come to recognize as the God of all. Naaman wanted God to be present in his life. When taken in the broader context of kings, this story is kind of baffling. Naaman, a representative of the nations, the anti-Israel, is convinced of God's goodness, power, and place as the one true God, when God's own people are losing sight of those foundational truths. Even in his imperfection, Naaman provides a discouraging but important contrast to God's people. Naaman seeks out healing, while Israel's leaders remain blind to their spiritual sickness. Naaman heeds, even if reluctantly, the words of a prophet of the God of Israel, while Israel's own leaders reject the prophets sent to guide them. Naaman listens to the voices of the humble and those without status in his household. He repents when he realizes he's been foolish and proud, and he responds with conviction and commitment when he encounters God's faithfulness at a time when many in Israel were looking to the gods of other nations to sustain them. Naaman reminds us, as he reminded Israel at the time, what it's like to experience God anew. Before God's grace and provision are old hat, minimized, or taken for granted. Even so, Naaman, the faithful convert, isn't the true protagonist of this story. Neither is Elisha, the miracle worker. Even the courageous servants who trust God's ability to heal and put themselves at risk to completely change the outcome of Naaman's story are not. God is because God was working through each of these people to make the impossible possible, to make the unexpected reality. This is a story of God working persistently to bring about good for an unexpected person in an unexpected way 
through unexpected people. And it's all happening with the backdrop of a failing and faithless Israel. Those who were expected to be a testament to God's very character and desires and presence in the world. It's a story of God showing his chosen people once again that nothing short of surprising grace and transformative love are an offer with this God. Sometimes the path to healing simply requires stepping into the long arc of God's covenant faithfulness without even fully comprehending what we're getting into. Thanks be to God. We can co-lead. <laughs> I have a stand for our sending song this morning. Number 827 in Voices Together, Move in Our Midst. 827. I'll blow D flat. again. I want to remind you that in the bulletin there are also a few other prayer reminders for you. Our college students Madison, Aiden, and Colin this week were especially holding in prayer and at the home we're holding Nida and I would add to that I hope this is okay that Gladys Slava could sure use your prayers right now too. So just to add that to your prayer list. So as benediction, go and experience God anew. Staying open to the unexpected. Go in peace. <laughs>